Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2015-2020. Purpose. Food-based recommendation, ages two and above, not babies. Target audience is policymakers, nutrition educators, health professionals there. It's a congressionally mandated effort every five years, joint oversight by Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And again, we've talked about this. I mean, this effort is a public health model, not a medical model, okay? Is it relevant to my patients when they ask me how should I eat? Yes. We can say read the guidelines, but it's primarily a public health uh, uh, strategy. Now, there's a history here. We've talked about deficiencies and how we've dealt with them. The world changed from, you know, 1910 to the 1960s in affluent nations by eliminating all these deficiencies. We did it through fortification and supplementation of foods. By the 1980s, it, has be it was becoming clear, and again, through the McCo George McGovern's committee in, in the Senate in the, in the 1970s, this realization that the health of Americans is changing as we live longer and life expectancy grows, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, weight gains, cancer, immunologic diseases of various types was becoming more common. Fewer people are dying from industrial accidents, car accidents. We're, we're, we know how to tackle the smoking. It is these chronic diseases of aging that are becoming the prevalent health issues. And in 1980, the Dietary Guidelines for America was at this cusp of going from, we need to make sure people eat healthy foods to prevent deficiencies, to, you know, we got to start thinking about how excesses and the orchestration of our food selection and perhaps our industry is contributing to a toxic food environment. Do you see what I mean? This transition from deficiencies, our biggest food nutrition problem, to excess and orchestration is our biggest nutritional problem. Do you see what I mean? So this is where this was first mentioned, 80, 85. Total diet approach first mentioned. The interface of diet and physical activity, this realization you have to bring in the physical activity thing with the food if you're going to deal with the diseases associated uh, with chronic disease and aging. How to adjust the amount of fats, carbohydrates, fruits and vegetables, etc., reduced meat, so food groups, and this really, really important thing of finally 2005, 2000, it's almost all focused on foods, not supplements and individual nutrients as we went into this last iteration. So to watch the evolution of this, very interesting. That's a whole, you know, PhD thesis in and of its own. We talked about these guidelines already, so I'm just going to pass the, the DRI issue. And we'll talk about the 2015 committee. So first of all, you hear, because these dietary guidelines impact industry in a big way, um, even before the guidelines ever come out, they have already spent millions to be prepared to spew out what I will label as propaganda, misinformation, lies, fabrication, and deceit, even before they come out, to protect what their industry should be protecting because a company is responsive to whom? Shareholders. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's our capitalist way, okay? Um, so if the meat industry is worried that the data that they are aware of might 
cause the dietary guidelines to say you shouldn't eat so much red meat, well, they're prepared. They're spending more money than the government did to make the guidelines to disseminate a counter argument, okay? And they hire journalists, they hire this, they give money there, put money in the pockets of the congressmen, etc. All the tools that they have that are legal within our society to counter these recommendations. So because this goes on, and it's well known, being chosen to be on this committee is not easy because if you have been supported by industry or have links to industry, have strong in, in opinions about it, own stock in any of the food industry or anything related to food and nutrition, you cannot be chosen to be on this. Okay? One of our members actually had to, do I have him on here? No, I think I took him off. One of the guys right here had to leave after a few months because he took a job with, I think, Weight Watchers or one of the, some, some corporate entity, and he had to be removed from the, the committee. But you can't have any bias, and this process of finding the folks for the committee takes, God, from the time they first asked me for my credentials and financial information, tax forms and every other thing, to being finally chosen to be on was clearly a year or more, okay? Well, once you give them the paper, once you give them all the papers, I mean, it's no big deal. Donald Trump would not have been chosen to be on that because one, he wouldn't give his taxes, and of course he has the Trump steak company that went out of business, but whatever. But very, very rigorous vetting, and I think anyone that criticizes the government for not that these people have biases, they're just, it's just a ridiculous statement, but I've seen that dozens of times in the media. And to be on this with all these great people, it's truly astounding. It's such a great privilege to go there and sit down with these people that work in different aspects of food and nutrition and really hear their input and their discussion, their debate, insight. You know, a phenomenal experience uh, to, to be around a group such as this. Now, it's, it's fun to just throw in a couple words about what committees are all about. So if Columbus had an advisory committee, not the city, but the explorer, he would still be at the dock, all right? I've searched all the parks in all the cities and found no statues to committees, all right? If you see a snake, just kill it. Don't appoint a committee on snakes. That's kind of Ross Perot who ran for president before you were born. The ideal committee is one with me as a chairman and two other members in bed with the flu. So committees are a challenge because you have lots of different opinions about things and you, you, you kind of have to come to consensus and there is a lot, a lot of effort to go through every nuance of these scientific issues. So. The first role of this group is to review the science, and that is informed by systematic reviews using the National Library of Medicine staff. They had 20, 30 people. I mean, if we sent them, here is a question. We need to know if the amount of time in front of a computer affects obesity. By the next day, they would have every single paper published on that in front of us. They were that good, and I would get things in the middle of the night from them. You talk about government workers that were committed. These people were phenomenal, okay? After you review all the data, you have to develop what the guidelines are going to be based on the science and nutrition. And this is where, at the end of this, there is a report, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report. At that point, the committee's done. The government takes over, and it is their role to start the implementation of the guidelines. And that means all the educational material, the final wording of the dietary guidelines after Congress had its chance to 
force them to modify certain statements based on uh, whatever you want to call the lobbying. <laughs> anyway, so let's kind of go through some of this. Again, you know, this process, this was like two years of work interrupted by another government shutdown on one of our meetings in Washington. Um, the advisory committee begins. We define subgroups of talent to work on specific topics in parallel. And then you work uh, on coming up with the committee's advisory report in 2015 where the government takes over and they write the guidelines into the right language they want to use and they were released, uh, you know, kind of in January of this year. And then it's up for all the government agencies to implement these findings until the next report comes out, which is the third phase. Uh, th <coughs> this year there were five different subcommittees on various topics. Um, when I went into this, I never would have guessed there would be one on food sustainability. This one caused an enormous amount of controversy, okay? And when we went into this, I was not thinking this way. This is where the other people on the committee brought me around to this, and it wasn't that hard because when we think about it, we're moving towards a world, you will live in a world with nine billion people, okay? That is an awful lot of people. And right now, we do not know how we are going to feed them. We think that you need to switch from primarily saturated fats to a diverse array of unfat saturated fats and that seafood and fish is a great source of omega-3s. We do not have enough fish to feed you. Okay, so we're getting to the point where the population is large enough that with the agriculture in its current state, we are not then able to do it in a sustainable way. So when you get down to this, you want a healthy food pattern, but you can't have a healthy food pattern at the expense of an environment that cannot sustain it. This gets into a lot, uh, again, a whole PhD thesis for a student here would be this issue of is modern nutrition with the amount of red meat that we consume sustainable because of the environmental impacts? I mean, we have to grow 100 acres or some enormous number of grain in order to feed a beef cow through its life to get so many pounds of steak. You see what I mean? This approach may not be sustainable. And in the seafood realm, uh, that's going to be even a bigger challenge. Now, it doesn't mean there aren't ways to come around with that with fish farming and other things. but these recommendations have to be thought through with at least some cognition of sustainability. Yeah, I guess my question is also It's recognized that America's dietary guidelines are used as a foundation by nations around the world who do not want to spend the money to go through this process. Um, and I think there are people, and I think all of us to some degree realize that in the modern world that is shrinking, we are part of one environment. <laughs> and just like global warming and fossil fuels, these are things that transcend our borders and that it's worth thinking about. Yeah, go ahead. Um, was it up to the <coughs> yes. Or yes. So you, you sit down there. And the first thing you do is go through what are the lists of topics that every member wants to throw onto the table that are important. Can we put these into categories? Okay. 
within the categories and we you know we may have had you know say on this one where I had a lot to do with the cancer part I mean we probably had 200 different topics listed then we had to say we can't do all of these prioritize and we're going to do systematic reviews down to about here and you eliminated the ones where we thought there would not be substantial enough data to be able to use or it could be that some other organization just did a big systematic review and you can borrow it why do another one three months after somebody else did a high quality report Do you see what I mean so you prioritize because you know you got two years you got to get this out the door you're not going to be able to do everything. You have to prioritize and come up with the things you think are the most impactful. But in the end, they fit to these things. Was there institutional Yes. <clears throat> so the beauty of the committee, they, they're very, they do this in a very nice way. They keep about five or so folks, don't keep, they re-up they ask several people from the past committee to be on this one because that institutional memory isn't so important for the science. It's important for the process. If you've been through it, the person that was on it last time will be chairman of this committee. They know how to make things move along so that you get done on time. You need that memory of process not so much memory of the facts. And so that was extremely valuable to have five people that have done this before. Okay? Really, really valuable. And then there are working writing groups on certain things that, that I listed at the bottom that just simply transcended everything. These four groups were thought to be so important that transcended every subcommittee that uh, people worked on together. So this report, which you can get at the, the website here, and here's the outline of it. Um, and you can see what the scientific report, it's very structured, very dry. You're never going to sit down and read this whole thing. And if you want to go to sleep at night, I mean, start reading it. This is a technical document. Okay, but the, the references are there, the evidence is there, it, this is where the data is. Okay, and um, a couple other things that were very helpful. So I talked about the National Library of Medicine, their beautiful systematic reviews. Then we worked with the USDA and did what are called food pattern modeling. So these are big computer programs now to say, if these are going to be our recommendations and we say, well, you need to reduce this amount of, say, dairy products, well, they have to do a whole modeling thing to make sure that if we do that, you're still getting enough vitamin D and calcium. Even if we're recommending reducing the amount of whole milk that gives you saturated fats. Do you see what I mean? Because in the end, you have to come up with a whole model that's an orchestration that meets all the goals. And this is where the, well, I won't use any insulting terms, but the representative of the national eat sugar industry, okay, is all up in arms, goes out and gives all these talks about, well, how did they come up with 10% sugar as being allowable? They didn't even talk about it to the last two weeks of the thing. This is just a rant and raving about sugar. And I want you to know, this is Diet Coke, just not, I don't, no sugar sweetened beverages. But it came out of food pattern modeling why you cannot have more than 10% of sugar in the DGA, Dietary Guidelines for America. And it came out of modeling because if you look at all the recommendations, in order to meet all those recommendations, that is going to require 90% of your diet. 
okay? Fruits, vegetables, dairy, protein, grains, legumes, etc. All that is left for discretionary sugar intake, if you want to have sugar, is 10% of your calories, okay? It's all that's left. So the sugar industry thinks that you should be doing a study to figure out the optimal amount of sugar in your diet. That's ridiculous. There is no such thing. Do you see what I mean? Well, let's go back to your starting point of yeah. nutrient. So sugar is a nutrient. Sugar is a source of calories, which is calories is one nutrient, which can be derived from sugar, complex carbohydrate, okay, protein, lipid, and alcohol. So sugar, meaning the simple sugar, can contribute calories and should not contribute more than 10% of the diet, okay? You don't need sugar, it's not a nutrient per se. Energy is, and it can come from sugar. But you can live a perfectly healthy diet for 100 years with no refined sugar. I said with no refined, Added sugar is a food processing exercise. It's a food where sugar, which is refined, is then put into the food. Okay? I mean, Coca Cola, Pepsi are not, you don't, you don't go out and harvest them off a vine. Okay? They are man made water, sugar, color and flavor. And free sugar is a big problem. Okay? It's a big problem. And you're never going to define an optimal amount, but it, it's, it's just funny how the industry really is going after this 10% number and say, oh, that's ridiculous. There's no evidence to say that's the optimal amount of sugar. And that's right. That is just simply telling Americans you have 10% of your calories that are discretionary. And if you want to have a Hershey's chocolate bar full of sugar, there's your 10% right there. If you want it to be sugar sweetened beverage, 10% right there. But the rest of your diet has got to meet all these other things. And if you go to, you know, wh where did they sell those big gulp 7-Eleven, uh, you know, 36 ounce sugar sweetened beverages? My God, that's your two week supply of sugar right there. If you're eating that, you cannot meet the other guidelines. You just can't. So evidence review, we've talked about that. I'm not going to say anything more key concept of what systematic reviews are. Um, you know, you review thousands of papers, you extract the data, look at the quality, combine the data, discuss the findings, and ultimately come up with kind of a summary of what those are. Um, there's a lot we can say about systematic reviews. Uh, then we have an evidence uh, and implication. So you review the evidence and you make a conclusion, which is meant to be an objective statement, and then you talk about the implications. What would those implement, what would the impl <coughs> implementation or implications of those st statements mean? Um, and frankly, if you look at that report that I tell you will put you to sleep, you can see that this review of data is rigorous, transparent, and minimizes bias. And not only is the document that you can read a summary of all this, there are web pages that will take you to all the systematic reviews. You can go and look at all of this data. It's an enormous amount of information if you really wanted to dig into it. Um, I've said a lot about the nutrition evidence library process. 
the NEL reviews and grading the published literature. Again, you can just read this on the handout. Um, you know, as to how we grade it from strong, moderate, limited, or not assignable. And for some things, like the question of eating out and health outcomes. So there's a lot of thought that people have that if you eat out every day, your nutritional intake will be worse than if you eat at home. Okay, that's a hypothesis. And largely it centers around the fast food idea, right? If you just eat at McDonald's or Wendy's and all this every day and your variety is simply which one of the fast food places you eat at, you're not gonna be eating a healthy diet. However, when you try to do a study of that, it's really, really impossible. This becomes enormously difficult because frankly, people eat crappy at home also. And frankly, if you truly want to eat out every day, you could actually eat out and eat healthy. But you have to pick right, okay? So there are studies published by sociology, public health people that try to target this question. Eating out, you know, they give you questionnaires. How many meals do you eat out a week? How many this? How many that? But when you get down to it, the data is not precise enough to draw a conclusion. You see what I mean? So we had systematic reviews like that where in the end, the data is just not rigorous enough. Uh, we didn't repeat if there were existing reports and they had to be regraded to fit with the Dietary Guidelines Committee grading. And um, for this group, I'm not gonna just say any more of that. There, this would have been the AICR <coughs> summary table that we created with regards to all the different diet and nutrition exercise food groups and various types of cancer and how they were related. So alcohol greatly increases risk of oral cancers, greatly increases esophageal, liver, breast, may have some effects on others. So this data was summarized from all the existing AICR, WCRF reports and put into the dietary guidelines for America. We did not need to repeat that. Um, <coughs> new questions on diet and cancer, and so again, this is for a cancer audience primarily, the slide, you know, were dietary patterns. And this is the newest direction is patterns that are related to cancer, not just foods, or nutrients. So these use different techniques, statistical clustering, uh, very sophisticated statistics, um, predefined dietary patterns. You can go into a big epidemiologic cohort now and say, tell me if a person meeting nine out of 10 dietary guidelines has a lower risk of colon cancer. But that's a complex mathematical analysis, okay? But you can do it in big data sets that are out there. You can ask questions about does a Mediterranean diet or a vegetarian diet impact the risk? And what cancers? So the dietary patterns question was addressed. Um, the number of studies in these is still modest, but the outcomes were uh, looking very good that what we think is a healthy dietary pattern is appropriate. Yeah. Let's 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 well let's let's kind of go over the history of how do we do a study to assess diet, nutrition, and cancer in people. You could do a clinical intervention trial, virtually impossible, because one, I can't put you on a diet for 20 years and have you follow it and somebody else not and see what happens. I'd need billions of dollars to do a study. So randomized controlled intervention trials are largely not going to happen. You have to do epidemiologic cohort studies, so you need to know what those are. Those are like the nurses health study at Harvard, where they went to the American Academy of Nursing and got lists of all the nurses in the United States, sent them uh, consent form, would you be in a study that we will monitor you for the rest of your life? 
and every couple of years you're going to fill out a questionnaire called a food frequency questionnaire and give us data on your health that we can get from hospitals and doctor's offices to verify. Now, this is how you came up with relationships, but first, the statistical tools that they had only allowed you to first ask questions like, all right, how many servings of tomatoes affect risk of something? Or how much estimated vitamin D, after calculating it from the amount of foods that you consume, were related to an outcome? It's only now that the more complex statistics of looking at 10 variables at once are starting to be looked at. There's less than 50 good papers on this looking at patterns. Do you see what I mean? And thousands of papers on the effect of alcohol on breast cancer, the effect of fruit and vegetables on stomach cancer. Do you see what I mean? It's very easy. Yes. Patterns. Yes. 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 However, the labels, as you know, are vague. You can have a study done in one place where they define Mediterranean one way, and then a Mediterranean pattern could be defined by another investigator a different way, because that word is vague. So that, that's why this is an emerging, dynamic, conceptual direction for the future that's going to be very, very important, I think, because it really gets down to the question of the whole pattern, not you know, eat pomegranate juice and you won't have a heart attack when you're 45. You see what I mean? So, data analysis, there's a lot of data analysis. You can just read this stuff. Um, all the data is available and you can get them uh, at the websites. So key elements of the healthy eating patterns. And the guidelines are in your handout. You can read these. A lot of them are things that make a lot of sense, very common sense, but remember, they're public health guidelines for the whole nation. And so, relates to following a pattern across the lifespan, variety, nutrient density. That's the opposite of sugar sweetened beverage. That is a nutrient undensed food. It has no nutrients in it other than calories. So you want foods that have many nutrients in them um, for the amount of calories you consume. So, limit calories from added sugars and saturated fats, reduce sodium intake. Americans have a sodium intake of about 4,000 to 4,500 milligrams a day. The requirement is somewhere between 1,500, 2,000, okay? Americans eat more than double the amount of salt every day to meet your requirement. That level is thought to contribute to disease processes. Not in everyone, because I know people can eat potato chips half of, half of their dietary intake and they never get hypertension, but I have people in my clinic, you reduce the sodium, the blood pressure goes right down. Sodium sensitive blood pressure. So. It's enough of a problem that it has to be stated here that people are way over on sodium. So who, what industry gets all bent out of shape about that? Snack foods. I mean, walk down the alley of the grocery store. I mean, there's a mile long thing of potato chips and crackers and every other thing that you can imagine with salt very heavy and the industry wants government to have no regulation of salt they want it to be merely tell people to eat less salt which of course is hard to do because it's in the foods you can stop putting it on out of the salt shaker but it's still in so many foods and the thing about it it's a very complex science because salt actually adds to, it's a flavor enhancement. 
people like it, if you do studies of it. So the countries that are successful in reducing salt are ones where the government intervenes and says, you can't have more than so much salt in the food. So that, why is that good for industry? They don't understand this. Why is that good? It makes an even playing field. You now all have to follow the same rule. Now the reason you can't get them to do it voluntarily is because the salt actually is a learned taste. Campbell Soup, you have to give them credit, 10, 15 years ago, tried to do the right thing. They said, wow, all these guidelines are going to come out telling people to eat less salt. Americans will have a demand for low salt soup, which is another high source of salt. They made a whole line of food, developed it, put it out. What happened? People didn't buy it. They have the low salt V8, and the, then they have the regular. Wow, this really tastes better. But studies have also shown that this is a learned taste and that once people adapt, I mean, you don't even notice it. So countries where they've instituted some of these changes by law, I mean, after a year or two, nobody even complains anymore, you know? So the salt one is one that I think is only going to be fixed by regulation. This will be interesting. I haven't studied it per se and looked it up, but I think Finland was one and I've heard something about Australia where they've tried to do this. But other countries are, are thinking through this and having this enormous battle uh, uh, regarding this. Um, so other recommendations here. Um, so the scientific report, no one interfered. Everybody reviewed it, consensus report, by the scientists, the scientific report. How that was turned into the guidelines that the public sees, it then is impacted. As a group of scientists, yes. you reach consensus. Absolutely. Even if you have a slightly different opinion, I didn't see any people stand up and stomp their feet and say, oh, I'm not going to be assigned my name to this. You know what I mean? So I should have asked when the picture was asked. Yet again, the behavior change is an implementation question to a degree, not the scientific evidence to form the guideline. So the, the guidelines have to be based on the health outcome and the diet. So then this becomes a question, if you are to implement the guidelines in this nation, how do we do it? Laws, education, behaviors, how do we instill the right behaviors, the right choices? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, I think in the future you should get more of that in, but it won't happen on the committee. But it won't happen because Congress is going to ban that because the industry doesn't want that. Yeah, so they're going to ban that. So the best way is giving the committee a And frankly, there wasn't a lot said in the report on sustainability. It's very, very, it's a foot in the door. It's a foot in the door that you, if you're going to think about guidelines for public health, you have to to think about it in the context of all the related components, one of which is sustainability. Um, they are in the process of, when they get a chance, certain congressmen write in little lines here and there on other bills that impact this process and will limit what the committee can do in the future. So this is one way in our current society, and I don't want to just get into politics here, but when you have a society that our law lawmakers do not have to put up a slide every time they say something about their conflicts of interest, which they should, those conflicts of interest impact what they do. 
And we'll talk about that in a bit because there's one more thing I want to get to. Riff, go ahead. Yes. I think everything is on the table. So this is where you guys and your training and understanding policy and doing the research to best define policy and advise our lawmakers. These, these are the things you're going to have to tackle. How do we best do it? I am not an expert in policy. I am just now learning about it through experience. You know, I wanted to be a scientist and a physician, and now I'm <laughs> doing public policy because that's where the impact is going to be. We know so much science, and we are not translating it through impactful public policy. How do we do it so that overall we get the best outcomes? Now, I want to get to something that's more light but fun, and we're going to get to it. You can read about these recommendations. These are just science stuff. What should you eat and stuff. But I want to get to something very important here, and I want to just show you a couple of these slides and then get to the what I want to talk about supplements for a minute. Current eating patterns in the U.S. Percent of population ages one and older who are below, at, or above a goal. So let's talk about vegetables. 80% in orange are not meeting the recommended vegetable intake. 10% are. Fruit, 70% are below. Total grains, 50% below. Oils, you know, what is the right degree of saturation, 80, 70% of Americans are not meeting the goal. Added sugars, we have 70% of Americans getting too much, 70% getting too much saturated fat, 90% of Americans getting too much sodium. So even though those recommendations, you may look on it, oh, they're up, these are all simple, they all make a lot of sense. We are so far off base in what we're actually doing in this country, we're nowhere near close, okay? We're terrible. So, same kind of thing. Empty calories, this gets to that sugar-sweetened beverages issue. Male, female, different age groups. I mean, this is one of our biggest problems. You know, you can see across the board, 70 to 90 to almost 100% of people are getting way too much sugar-sweetened beverages. You can, here's the vegetables over the lifespan. So you can just look at this data at your leisure for fun, because I really want to get to the, we know there are big disparities in this country, social, economic, ethnic, whatever you want to call it, cultural differences. Those were addressed as topics within almost everything, where there was data to say something. Yeah, and obviously ultimate implementation of dietary guidelines requires awareness of the social, economic, and cultural issues. I mean, my God, we have places in Columbus where a resident in a poor part of town would have to drive two or three, four miles to get to a grocery store, and in between their home and the grocery store will be 50 fast food restaurants, or 7-Elevens, or gas stations, where these people buy most of their food, and most of the food is garbage, okay? I don't want to say that, that's overstating it. But most of their, they are restricted in their ability to buy affordable, healthy food. That is a problem. There are counties in in Ohio who where there is no grocery store. In my neighborhood in Dublin, you know, I can't go half a mile without having the choice of every damn food on earth. Okay, at an exorbitant price. You can get a broccoli stick in water at Whole Foods for like 10 bucks, you know, broccoli broccoli infused water. I mean, holy smokes. I mean, you can do that just by putting a dollar's worth of broccoli on your steamer and drinking the water. Um, but anyway, uh, 
a lot of cultural, social issues, food insecurity, how we're going to, you know, make some of these goals on implementation are a big issue, and it depends on Washington. Um, implementing through the MyPlate program, this is a computer-based effort, great tool that you can work with, with apps and stuff on smartphones uh, to help, but people, by and large, need education to do this. How are we going to provide that in our schools or other, other ways to, to, to make this work? And I won't say anything more other than this one slide that sustainability was brought up in this, caused a lot of controversy. And uh, people who think they know everything are a great annoyance to those of us who do. Uh, and let me see, there's been a lot of annoyance in the last year, and I won't go into this, but my goodness, the nitwits that think they know something about nutrition that come out of the woodwork uh, are amazing. And there's a lot of politics related to this, and I think Carl Sandburg's quote there, if the facts are against you, argue the law. If the law is against you, argue the facts. If the law and the facts are against you, pound the table and yell like hell. And this is kind of what I've watched over the last year. It's very interesting. And I think two things that you might want to read if you were really into this would be uh, the money behind the fight over healthy eating and Mary and Nestle uh, food politics both give you a lot of insight into this whole complex dynamic. And boy, I was really provocative on this, right? Does anyone have any brains? So know the difference between public health recommendation and implementation. I saw a congressman get up last fall and say, the dietary guidelines are a complete failure because our health outcomes are getting worse. Obviously, this person, I won't say what they are, but they do not understand that a recommendation requires implementation. So the science is there. If you, congressman, don't implement the science, it will be a failure. It's not the science that's a failure. It is you, the implementer, that is the failure. Okay? Um, here's one from a representative. The guidelines which the government published since 1980 might be rated a failure given the nation's high rates of everything. Can you think of an example illustrating why the statement is profoundly stupid? Of course, it's implementation. Um, you know, they need to support better research and implement the programs through regulatory systems to, to have an impact. Um, it's really not the science issue. So, I just can't get out of this. I think one of the things that we were not advised to get into is the whole dietary supplements issue, because that kind of overlaps with the FDA, the Federal Trade Commission, even though it is part of what we would consider food, nutrition, and health. So I can't get away without saying something about this. And are you talking? Are you having other sessions on supplements in this course? You'll touch on it. So, I assume all of you have seen the great uh, movie, The Wizard of Oz, uh, The Great and Powerful Wizard. Of course, the truth is, behind all that smoke and mirrors behind the curtain is just uh, deceit, quackery, and, and fraud. And, of course, in our modern day era, we have a whole nother uh, Wizard of Oz and a, a modern day purveyor of, of nutrition quackery day by day uh, trying to sell and market some gimmick on, on TV. Uh, just an absolute, I mean, ethically he belongs in jail. Legally, yes, he has a right to, to be a crook, but um, we have some real challenges in the food industry. Neil is an expert on some of this labeling issues and challenges. I mean, I have a lot of trouble with Oreo cookies being sold as a smart cookie just because they put a little bit of uh, whole grain into that uh, product. Uh, you know, we all like an Oreo once in a while, right? They're just too good, but, you know, this is going too far. Even, even this, 
um, here you have milk. They're putting omega-3s in there. Well, look, 60 milligrams in a cup. A six-ounce serving of salmon has 800 milligrams. If you want your omega-3s, don't buy chocolate milk. Okay? Go eat a piece of salmon. Um, I have my own bias about Deshay. We'll talk about that. It should be repealed and revised. There needs to be more enhanced FDA oversight, and the Office of Dietary Supplements is a great asset, but underfunded. We have to demand safety, quality control, and accurate labels on food items. Yeah, we make people bring them in in a bag, line them up, and we review every single one of them for the scientific evidence. I, as a clinician with patients, have to make sure that they keep coming to get their chemotherapy, hormone therapy, radiation, and biological therapy. The psychology of taking care of an individual is that I cannot have a battle about should you be taking a green tea thing and whether there's evidence to support it. It's not worth the fight to make that barrier. I have to make sure they're getting good things. I tolerate in an individual supplements if I do not see a danger. So I'm tolerant. Oh, 90 percent. 90 percent. Yeah. You need to know... Oh, listen, you got cancer. What do you do, man? This is panic time. And if there's something you think you can do to thwart that that's being sold by Dr. Oz, well, that's a pretty modest investment when you're facing all these other surgical and procedures, chemo, hormone therapy, radiate. I mean, you are looking. You are preying upon the most susceptible people. That's what is so disgusting about it. Okay, Deshay, you need to know, 1994, this law was put into effect in large part by something I had something to do with, and I'm going to digress to a very brief little story. This is my wedding day. No, day before. And I'm at work. I've junior faculty at Dana-Farber and Harvard, and I have a patient that I took care of for breast cancer who was cured, radiation, chemotherapy, surgery. She calls me and says, I am really sick. Fevers, chills, sweats, my muscle aches. I can hardly walk. I cannot swallow without vomiting. I cannot get solid food down. I don't know what's wrong. And I said, come in, I'll see you. This is 9 o'clock in the morning. Rehearsal dinner and all that stuff is the end of the day. She comes in. I greet her in the waiting room. She can't walk. I had to get a wheelchair. She's only 42 years old. Take her to the exam room. Fever, 203. She's red. I, I kind of was looking at the breast where we had the, the cancer removed. It was literally like wood. Her muscles felt like cement. Did a blood test. Normally, your white blood cell count is between 5 and 10 thousands per milliliter. Hers was 135, and they were all not the five different flavors of white blood cells that you have. They were 99% something called eosinophils. Okay? This is weird. Unless you have a rare form of leukemia called eosinophilic leukemia. I had to admit her right away to the hospital to get this workup going. Now, thankfully, at Harvard, Dana-Farber, you got great teams on inpatient, and I was able to go through the wedding, and 
we were going to do the honeymoon the next year, but we were going to do these, you know, five days in New York City with our friends just to have a good time. So Monday, I open up the newspaper. One of the great joys in life is reading the New York Times. So I'm honeymoon, I'm reading the New York Times. Well, in the middle of the front section, about page 10, rare blood disorder detected in 30 Americans reported to the CDC. Eosinophilia. Okay. So, I called back and said, I just saw in the New York Times, they then got a hold of the CDC, same kind of thing. It's called eosinophilia myalgia syndrome. Okay? Tens of thousands of people in the country had this during this episode. Somewhere, I think, between one and 2,000 died from this. My patient had permanent disability from this. Muscle, esophagus, anywhere that had radiation turned to wood. Okay, I mean solid. She recovered, but permanently disabled from this. The cause of this was a supplement called L. tryptophan. An amino acid. This should be no big deal. Why did people take L tryptophan? Help them sleep. Precursor to serotonin. Okay? Why did that happen? Well, the manufacturer in Japan wasn't as good at chemistry as they could be. There were micro contaminants of dimers of this amino acid in there a very foreign and toxic compound. They shipped that from Japan to the U.S. where supplement companies put that into products sold all over the country. This was a disaster. Okay? So, what happens? Congress has committees on supplements and there was a big push to get monitoring, labeling, prove chemically that you have a safe product, okay? So what do you think happened after that? Any idea? Lobbying. Ooh, big time. Big time lobbying. Not only did they prevent more oversight of the supplement industry, they weakened it. They passed a law that actually basically allows, you know, I could cut my grass clippings and put them into a capsule and sell it as a chlorophyll supplement. There is no oversight in this country. Okay? You buy something, you trust. Okay? When the New York City Mayor Bloomberg did bought supplements in New York City that are being sold, analyze them for what's in it, read the report garbage. Ginseng is onions. I mean, garbage. Okay? Buyer beware. So this is the current standards. Now, we will end, if this will work, and if you have to leave, you can leave, but this is a remarkable thing on TV, if it will come up. Well, it, it's what he's talking about. That's that's. It's astounding how they nailed this on that show. So we can do more questions, and then you can.